Hi, I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. I really love family photographs, all of them. From the mystery images you find in shoeboxes and albums, to the pictures you snap with your digital devices, no mystery is too small. A simple question about an image can lead to new stories of your ancestors. This means you can count on me to help you identify the people in them, offer solutions for preserving and organizing them, and yes, even guide you in the various ways to gather and share picture stories with your relatives. Hi, I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. Thank you for listening. In this episode, I'm talking with two curators at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. They have a new area to teach children American history. In April 2019, I was in Philadelphia with Pam Pacelli Cooper, president of Verissima Productions. We were there to present our films, Revolutionary Voices, at the Museum of the American Revolution. You can find the films on MaureenTaylor.com under Projects. While there, I was given a tour of their new educational space, Revolution Place, which is on the lower level of the museum. Curator Mark Turdo spoke with me about this exciting new space for children to learn about the revolution and the hands-on experience incorporated there. He also told me stories of how children interact with the core exhibition space. My name is Mark Turdo. I'm the curator here at the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, today, we're actually in Revolution Place, our discovery center on the lower level of the museum. And one of the goals we had early on was to make the museum very much a part of our neighborhood. And one of the ways we thought we would do that is to reflect the 18th century neighborhood somewhere in the museum. So we created Revolution Place to be a miniature uh, neighborhood. So what, we're actually sitting in the tavern right now, but when you come in, you come in from outside the city as if you're walking into the city. You come to a military encampment where you can, through a digital interactive, join the Continental Army. And then you're taken right to a camp with a tent where you can put on, try on uniforms, see what it's like to live in the tent. From there, you can go to a stall in the market on Market Street. Then here to the tavern, we have a, a non-denominational house of worship. We have a parlor and then a series of streetscapes. All of that's in this space. So it's, it's basically a miniature neighborhood that families can explore. Everything's reproduction here. Everything's hands-on. So you can try on all the clothes. You can take the newspapers off the wall. You can try on the hats, sit at the tables, and do what people in the 18th century would have been doing. And it's, it's a wonderfully immersive experience. One of my favorite things to talk about happened at this very table. Uh, early on, we had a series of young girls here. And they, were, they put the hats on, and they pulled the newspapers off the wall, and they started reading it. And one of them, I was able to hear her say, hey, this, this news is from London. This news is from Paris. This is like the internet. And, and they got it. We actually had been saying this is the internet cafe of the space. We never said that. It's not on the wall anywhere. But she said it just by having the experience. So that's actually what we hope Revolution Place does is give people the tools to explore, make connections, enjoy themselves. Everything that's down here reflects what they see in what we call our core exhibit, which is the second floor main exhibition here at the museum. And basically, they work very well together. And families can come down here. The, the core exhibit is written probably at a higher reading level, where down here is much more open. And, and younger, uh, younger visitors, as well as adults, have really enjoyed this space because of that. Right now, Revolution Place is not open to the public. Uh, it is on weekends and come our busy season, so into the summer. It will be open seven days a week. And th there are plans to make this more commonly accessible. Uh, it is a space that you have to come down to. It's not right off of our, our uh, atrium, our entryway. But people have been finding it when it is open. Uh, but as, as I say, it will be accessible, especially during our busy season. It'll be open seven days a week, just like the museum. So how do children, what do you see the children interacting with in the main exhibit? How do you see them interacting? Children in the main, in the core exhibition are taken with, I think it's easy to say, they're taken with the weapons sometimes. 
You know, it, it's, they're very dramatic and they get that. They get it, they may not understand exactly the implication of looking at a real weapon and what it did in the period, but they understand what a gun is. They understand what a sword is. But I don't think that's the only thing that gets their attention. And, and that's something I think that some people have, have overinterpreted. Um, uh, that's something I think that people just assume that kids like weapons. The other thing we're seeing is kids are seeing themselves in the galleries. And sometimes it's as simple as we have a tableau of a snowball fight between uh, men from different parts of America that Washington's breaking up the, the New Englanders from fighting with the Southerners. And in the left-hand side of that, you'll see a figure, a life-cast figure of a nine-year-old boy who's about to throw a snowball. That young boy's name is Israel Trask, and that whole tableau is based on his memory of that moment. And if you're in that gallery with, with kids, especially nine or 10 year olds, it takes them a moment, but they realize, wait, there's someone here that's my size that looks like me. And suddenly, and I heard this in our very first tour upstairs, I heard a group of boys look at Israel, Israel Trask figure and say, wait, there were kids back then. And slowly that news filtered across all of them until they realized, wait, we could have been here. We could have been part of this. And that's, we don't write that anywhere. We don't say that anywhere. They made that connection. Um, and I think they do that throughout the exhibitions. They'll see um, a portrait of someone who maybe is, has the same background as they do. Maybe they see uh, a musket ball. And we have one that's actually from the, the statue that was melted down of King George III. I've seen kids walk by and go, that's a bullet. And then they read the story and go, wait, that came from the statue. And suddenly they're making connections on their own. Certainly when they get uh, to what we call Gallery 12, you'll, we actually have a reproduction, full-size reproduction of a sloop. It's only the front half of the sloop. We couldn't fit the whole thing in. But everything from the mast forward, it's full-size. And you can go up on there and you can actually wheel a cannon back. You can learn to, to load it fire it on the sloop. It's, it's wonderful because they can play, they can, they can touch things. And we have done a few things here that I think museums are doing more and more, and that's allowing touchable moments throughout the exhibition. So that when you go into our gallery where we have a reproduced liberty tree, if you look inside that, it's, it's an artificial tree, obviously, but in, uh, uh, set inside of it, is a piece of the last standing Liberty Tree from Annapolis, Maryland. That tree came down in 1999 and we were able to acquire some boards from it. As soon as they learned that was a real Liberty Tree, everybody wants to touch that. It's, it's putting them in contact with history in a way that they wouldn't get just reading about it or even seeing our artificial tree. It's really powerful to me because it's so simple, but it's tactile and it's immediate. And Almost every school group that I've ever observed go through there, they want to touch that. When it's just families, I see they want, you know, kids want to touch that. And then we have similar moments sprinkled throughout the exhibitions. I will say, and, and I say this a lot to people, the assumption is our digital interactives, the, hand, the, the, the technical hands-on pieces in the exhibition, uh, people will tell me that's what kids love. But to be honest, in my observation anyway, kids use them, but it's the adults that are enthralled by them. Kids are spending time with what we consider traditional, maybe old-fashioned exhibition displays. They're looking at objects, they're looking at the tableau, they're, they're looking at the art on the walls and trying to figure out what does it mean. Later that day, Adrian Wally, senior manager of K-12 Education, showed me one of the interactive computer displays. It depicts the neighborhood around the museum on a period map. I'll let her explain. Hey friends, my name is Adrian Whaley. I am the senior manager of K through 12 education at the Museum of the American Revolution. One of my favorite spaces in our institution is on our lower level, we've got this great hands-on discovery center called Revolution Place. And inside of that, we've got four built environments that are meant to simulate what Philadelphia is like in about the mid 1770s. So right during the revolutionary era. We've got a tavern space, we've got a worship space, we've got a camp space for soldiers, and we also have like a middling class parlor. And inside of each of those areas, we also have a digital interactive. So there's lots of things you can touch and play with, but we also have these screens that are meant to tell you more about the stories of Philadelphians during the revolutionary era. 
So inside of the parlor is my favorite digital interactive because what it has is a map of the block that our museum sat on or continues to sit on today during the 18th century. And within that map, you can see all of the different lots that were in that area, as well as who owned those lots and maybe even who lived in those lots. You get to find out, so who's in charge of each of those spaces. You get to find out their jobs and definitions of what those jobs actually mean. You get to find out all the different members of their households. And so as you scroll through, you can find out what this neighborhood in revolutionary Philadelphia looked like. And it's a really interesting, I think, moment to see all of this because where we sit in Philadelphia truly is Philadelphia's old city. It is the space that had been laid out by William Penn. And so as you're looking at this area, when you think about revolutionary Philadelphia, our block is it. One of my favorite parts of the Museum of the American Revolution other than the memorial wall depicting images of last muster individuals, of course, is Washington's tent. I'll let Mark describe some of the details. Washington's war tent, the theater show. It's a, it's a great program. It's, it's a combination of a lot of needs that we had as a museum. First of all, we, had, we wanted to make sure we could preserve the tent. We wanted people to see it, first of all. And when you put an object like that out, and by an object like that, I mean a textile, especially one that's going to wind up being under so much weight, its own weight when it's up, would ultimately cause it to rip. And we're not in the business of having objects deter deteriorate under our watch. So first thing, we knew we wanted to show that tent to as many visitors as we could, but we also wanted to preserve it as best we could. The, the tent theater is actually, not only is it a multimedia theater, it's the storage box for the tent so that it is preserved through climate, through light exposure, which is why you only see it for 30 seconds at a time. But before you see it, we tell you this very rich story that starts with Washington, but it takes you on this journey, and I'm not gonna spoil it for everybody, it takes you on this journey that you don't expect. And it ends almost in, into today. And along the way, one of the things that's been fascinating is, hmm, sorry. I can cut it. I know, that's yeah. why I yeah, stopped. Yeah, I was like, yeah. um, to get to that, one of the things we had to think about, and this all happened before I came on, but uh, it was very clear the conversation was it, we wanted to tell a dramatic story because it's a dramatic piece. But most people probably aren't going to get too excited about a tent, even Washington's tent. So we sat down and thought, well, how do we talk about this? in a way that's gonna get people to realize what it is. So when you go to the theater, it's not just Washington's tent, it's a symbol of his leadership, and ultimately it becomes a symbol of the American nation. And, and we, we want to tell that bigger story. So we came up with the idea of telling you this broad swath of the, the tent story, starting from Washington's acquiring it, living in the field during the revolution, going home, packing it away, and then how it is preserved through the 19th century and what happens to it. And as I said earlier, it's a really unexpected and wonderful story. There are connections that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think, uh, you wouldn't think about. There are people involved who I think would be surprising to most. And at the end of this, at the end of the show, people are walking out excited about history, excited to learn more, excited that the tent survived. You know, it's rare in museums that you get people walking out so, ex so excited about an object like that. And this theater has had people leave it crying consistently. I honestly have never seen, uh, except in a few very rare cases, um, a history museum exhibition do that with people. And this is just a, a 12 minute, 11 minute show. So we tell you a very big story very quickly but it seems to have a very high impact. And it's one of the, it's, if not the most memorable moment of our exhibition, it's certainly top three. I hope that you'll include a trip to the Museum of the American Revolution in your travel plans. If you go, take a selfie in front of the memorial wall at the end of the court exhibition and share it on social media with the hashtag last muster. For more information on the museum, go to www.am R-E-V-M-U-S-E-U-M dot org. Perhaps you have an image of your Revolutionary War ancestor. It's actually possible if they lived after 1839 into the age of photography. 
If you do, let me know by emailing me at photodetective at MaureenTaylor.com. You can learn more about my last muster project on MaureenTaylor.com under projects. Both volumes of The Last Muster are for sale on my website. Do you have a photo identification story you'd like to share with me? Email me, or even better, videotape yourself telling me the story. You might end up on The Photo Detective. Thank you for watching and listening. You can submit your questions for future episodes using the Ask Maureen button on MaureenTaylor.com or through any of my social media contacts. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as The Photo Detective and on Facebook at Maureen Photo Detective. I hope you'll come back for the next show. Don't forget to send me your questions.